Welcome to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology. You are now joining us for part two of our discussion of the doctrine of limited atonement. So I agree with you that everyone does limit the atonement at, at some, like if, if right. you're thinking about that chain that I made earlier, everybody that's not a universalist put some kind of a limitation, whether it's the intent, the extent, or the application. If you believe in a doctrine of hell that has anybody in it, you have a limitation on the atonement at some point. Correct. Um, and that's what, great segue, great straight guy. So I have this written down. Um, Christ's sacrifice was sufficiently meritorious to cover all sin, but is efficient only for those who believe. In other words, in order to receive the benefits of the atonement, one must believe, have faith, etc. There's a qualification for the benefits of the atonement. And in the spirit of our last series, um, we we listened to, I guess it was a podcast episode of Leighton Flowers. He had Ken Hemphill on there, and they said a lot that I disagree with, but they were very careful to say that salvation is predicated on repentance and faith. Mm-hmm. And so that, that is an area of common ground that we have with him. Uh, it is the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross that pays for our sins. And that is applied to us. Our, our sins are expiated. God's wrath is propitiated by our repentance and faith. And so that is, again, unless you're a universalist, we're still kind of on the common ground right, there. Right. And I want to say, I believe those are our brothers in Christ. Uh, and, and I want to highlight where we can agree with them. And that's not, I, th- I think some people on both sides of the aisle, if I can put in a political term, yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes miss that. I, I think there are some Calvinists who believe that maybe our, in order to not be limited to atonement, you have to be a, a universalist. Um, Although, and I think maybe Leighton Flowers did miss it because he did make this statement, and this may not be a word-for-word quote because I was listening to the podcast, and then I would pause the podcast and repeat to the best of my ability on my iPhone what, what he just said so I'd have it for, <laughs> Which for later. Which is subversively undermining your dictation anyway. <laughs> right, but right, That's right. a different topic. So he says something like, everything rises and falls on the atonement. I think this is where Calvinists get it really wrong. Did God provide an opportunity for everyone to get saved? Question mark or just a few, is the atonement sufficient for all? Was that Leighton Flowers or Ken? I, I'm pretty sure it was Leighton Flowers. Okay. We'd have to go back um, and listen to it. And you can Google those yeah. um, and Maybe find we'll them. Maybe we'll link to it. Yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can put links to all the stuff that we read. And that's not where the discussion is. Um, I don't know of a Calvinist who would say Christ's sacrifice and his atonement was so small that God could only eke out X number of elect people and that's why it's just not sufficient for everybody. He just didn't have it in the bank so he could only pay for a few. That's yeah. that's not limited atonement. Now, every time I've heard a classical presentation of the Calvinistic doctrines of sovereign grace, the point is very clearly made up front, sufficient for all efficient only for the elect right right and I know some people may think gosh that's semantics or splitting hairs or whatever but Calvinists want to protect the fact that the sacrifice of God in Christ on the cross or God as I mean what the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is boundless in its value it's not that there's some bucket of merit and God can only sprinkle so many people before he just runs out. I mean, right. that, that neither side agrees, that, agrees with that. And the, the implicit charge is that Calvinists believe that from this comment, and that's just unfair. Right, and it would also be unfair for Calvinists to say all people who are not limited to atonement are universalists. So those would be, I think, both straw men from either sides. So I think most people, agree that it's sufficient but only efficient unless you're a universalist yeah sufficient for all efficient right calvinists would say efficient only for the elect 
I think you're saying any non-universalist will say efficient only for some. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so then the debate becomes why? Why is there a step down from sufficient for all to efficient only for some? All right. Um, so, like I said, some of the questions from uh, the unlimited atonement folks are the extended atonement. Did Jesus actually pay for all sins? Um, did the Father intend for, uh, through Jesus for all people to be saved? Um, so that kind of frames our discussion. Mm -hmm. And now I want to do one of those classical 90 degrees with, <laughs> with our discussion. And hang in there with me. But I do want to return to open theism. What we're, we said we weren't going to talk about. Right. We're yeah. not going to argue for open theism, but I want to use... I hope not. <laughs> or, or even against it. Okay. Um, but I want to use some of the strategies that we might use in arguing against open theism and show how that might be applicable to our discussion today. So if you're not familiar with open theism, I know Gregory Boyd was a big mm -hmm. proponent. There have been others. But basically, they look at passages that talk about God repenting, God changing his mind. Uh, one of the classic ones is in Genesis 6, where it says the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And he goes on to say, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so then brings on the flood where God, you know, he really messed up, and now he's changing his mind. And... He's going to wipe everything out and start over. You find similar type references, you know, past the Ten Commandments. Before well, before that, you have Genesis 18, I think it is, where God tells Abraham, now I know. You're, because You're getting ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you jumped to Moses. Sorry. Oh, we, no, no, I'm sorry. Not going chronologically, huh? Right. Well, yeah. Okay. No. So I want to, so there's another passage where, then we'll get to the Genesis 18 okay. one where you know he's with Moses and he says you know it grieves his heart i don't have the exact verse or quote here but and then Moses changes his mind by inner oh, intercessory says, get out of the way i'm going to wipe them out and make a new people out of you right and, yeah. he's, and he prays and he says you know what about what will the nations think you just did all this stuff in egypt okay so now if we take the logical extent of how we're viewing those verses into other verses like genesis 18 won't you read that one for us oh do you oh i have it right here so i'll just read it okay and the lord said the outcry of sodom and gomorrah is indeed great and their sin is exceedingly grave i will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me and if not i will know so if we take this to be true like the inference from the the noah passages god when god created man he didn't know how bad they, they were going to get and it, it it grieved him and repented well if we take this one straightforward then god doesn't even know what's going on with Sodom and gomorrah in the present yeah he, he doesn't know um and then there's some in deuteronomy where it talks about well real quick i go ahead had it wrong in genesis 22 with the sacrifice of isaac 22 12 God said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your only son, your only son from me. So open theists would say God learned right. what Abraham would do because of that language, which I think is pretty easy to show that you no, know, God, God is using anthropomorphisms right. to explain something in terms we would understand. In the same way in Deuteronomy where Jesus, or Jesus, Moses is talking about the Jews being tested so that God could know what was in their heart. So either, if you take all these passages together, God doesn't know what's happened in the past because he doesn't know what Sodom and Gomorrah has done. He doesn't know what's happening in the present because he doesn't know the, the hearts of the Israelites. And he doesn't know what's going to happen in the future because he creates man and then he repents. Mm -hmm. how, how do we make sense of this? Well, I guess our view of God's just wrong, right? right. <laughs> Maybe God doesn't know everything. Maybe well, God's not eternal. God's view of God would then be wrong too, because at times He says that He declares the end from the beginning and everything makes times things past, which yes. have not been done. Yeah. So, how do we take these verses and make sense out of them? And you already mentioned. Well, I think it's clear these are anthropomorphisms. Mm -hmm. They are ways of the talking about God in a way that we as man can understand. Even though God is unlimited and eternal, we are 
not either one of those. Right. And so he condescends to us and talks to us in a way that allows us to understand his nature. So how does this relate? Well, I think we're going to have to make some determinations like that in this discussion. And while no one probably when reading those things goes, oh, that's my philosophy that helps me determine whether or not God knew something in the past, or it was my philosophy that helps me know that um, God's not a door, that that's just a figurative language to help me understand what God is. It's our philosophy and other scripture that are going to help us say, okay, understanding the full breadth and scope of scripture, how we make sense of these verses. I, I'm not saying that the Arminians don't try to do the same thing, right. but that's what we're going to do, and we're going to end up in, in a different place than the Arminians. Anything yep. else you want to say on that? No, I think it's one thing that's going to come out, I think, as we address some of the kind of big objections uh, or what an unlimited atonement proponent would say is a positive verse in their favor. Um, you know, frequently we're going to say, well, this passage isn't talking about the atonement. It mentions it in passing, but that's not its purpose. And when we look at it, da 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 da, but, you know, it's important. I go to the passages that are didactic about the atonement and say those are the chief passages by which I derive my doctrine. Other passages that mention it in passing have a secondary status and, and have, I mean, direct teaching on a topic, I, I want to say always, but I'll just say almost always has to trump indirect mention of the same topic. It just, that's the way it works. So, yep. so that's, so what I'm giving you is our philosophical presuppositions about God and the Bible can help us distinguish. And what you're saying is, and even more, when we look at the Bible, some verses should have priority because that's the main topic where others, the topic's there, but it's in a you know tertiary way. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay, so that brings me to at least my, how I early on as a young guy, before I knew what I was getting myself into, I was a limited atonement guy. <laughs> I think we're all kind of brought up with the gospel, maybe not all, my upbringing in you know Baptist church in, in Arkansas, you hear the gospel presented, Christ died for everyone, you know, come, you know, you can have your sins forgiven. But as I become, became more and more aware of God's nature, some questions came to mind. This is probably my, you know, young teenage years. So if God is truly eternal, so this is how I think whether you're a Arminian or a Calvinist, you should still be limited atonement. That should not be the one point. The four pointer should be four point for, you know, they should be thrown away a different point instead of this one. <laughs> um, if we understand God's nature, God is an eternal being. Now I know that William Lane Craig, Greg Kokel, and others have made a lot recently out of saying, well, once the creation event happened, God now became temporal. Different discussion for a different time. I don't believe that. I used to believe that. Since then, I've had great teaching uh, at SES by Dr. Bridges. There's your plug. <laughs> and have come to realize that is an error. God's being is different than our being. He is an eternal being. He is outside of time. He exists in eternity. And C.S. Lewis gives this analogy, and you can push the analogy too far, of God, it's like our timeline, which we are in time. We're temporal beings. We have temporal becoming. We experience change over time. Um, but that is like a book that's open that God can behold, and he can see the beginning from the end. So with, with that proper understanding of God in mind, God's actions are like one and done. It's not like he's doing stuff in time. It, he is acting from an eternal now, even though what we experience is a temporal becoming a chronological moment by moment passing. So while I haven't heard any of the folks put it this way, I think the logical conclusion 
from how some of them word their uh, understanding of unlimited atonement, Tim Barnett specifically, which we'll get to one of his quotes, um, it's as though they view the sacrifice that God, that Christ, uh, God the Son gave on the cross, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, built up this bucket of merit. Mm -hmm or this bucket of righteousness. And now God's waiting as people make a decision to come through that door and, you know, bestow that righteousness on them. Okay, now you've met the condition. Now I'm going to pay for your sins. And I agree from our standpoint as folks in time, that's what it seems like. And I think if we only take man's point of view, then we're going to get a lot of the doctrines wrong, not just this one. But when we take God's point of view, who's the one who is actually doing the atoning, God the Son with God uh, the Father, it is a once and for all act, uh, which is done in, in time for us, but God sees that in eternity as covering all those who he would know from before the foundation of the world, mm -hmm. not to get into unconditional election. <laughs> All right, um, anything that you would say about that way of reasoning to unlimited atonement? That, I, know, that, I know this isn't your, <laughs> this isn't how you love to reason to it, so that's fine. No, I, th I think I didn't hear anything in there that set off warning bells for me. Um, the coming in with the bucket metaphor makes me desperately want to go to total depravity, but <laughs> I, I will uh, abstain. Um, I think it's, it may be important to acknowledge at this point that your definition of limited atonement that everyone ought to agree with isn't really the definition of limited atonement that Calvinists are arguing, right? That, in one sense, the atonement is limited, and everyone ought to agree with that. But in, in another sense, we're saying that that was God's intention, that, that his intention was limited only to his elect. And so I think there may be some people out there that are like, yeah, you're right, but that's not the point that I'm arguing for or against. So, Well, yeah, let me respond to that, because I mean that philosophically I think you can come to the conclusion that the intent extent and application of the atonement are limited okay. because God acts from eternity not in time so God knows who is going even if you don't hold to unconditional election or irresistible grace and that you think that um, there's some provenient grace that kind of brings us all up even and then out of your free will you choose and you exercise faith even if you believe that god knew that you would do that one of the things we're assuming is god's omniscience mm -hmm. so if god knows who is going to believe even if he's not drawing you in the traditional calvinist sense during that once and for all payment you are paid you are the person he had in mind when he paid for your sins at the okay. cross through the sun. Uh, the extent, the intent, the application are once and for all from eternity known by God. So there was no, there's no need for God to sit there and anticipate who's going to and who doesn't, no matter how he draws them. Gotcha. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, uh, I would agree that's not the way that I would argue <laughs> to get there, but yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, so I think from that standpoint, everyone should be limited to in all three of those aspects because God is acting from eternity. I welcome your feedback on, on that. <laughs> Maybe that is a good title for another day. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't thought through it from that perspective, so I'd yeah. rather have some time. Yeah. Okay, so let's move away from the philosophical arguments and go to scriptural arguments. Um, and I'll set this up and then turn it over to you, Michael. But when we were, I was listening to R.C. Sproul, and he had this quote that I thought was really good because I never thought about it this way. And he was saying, did Christ die for the possibility that all men could have their sins paid? 
if that's true, then the logical um, follow on of that is that it's possible that no men get their sins paid. Mm -hmm. Because if he's just dying for the possibility, then, then there could be a zero. Or does Christ's death ensure the salvation of the elect? Did, was it the elect that he had in mind when, when he died? Yeah. And I, that's what we both agree. Yeah. So uh, did you want to pick up with some of the Hebrews passages? Yeah, we can. I mean, this desperately makes me want to go back to total depravity because if, if he died for the possibility for us to do what we're unable to do. But again, we'll right. get there. We'll right. get there. Uh, so, yeah, in Hebrews, let's see, um, chapter 9, obviously 7 through 10 is kind of the big passage that deals with uh, Christ as high priest and his sacrifice. Um, verse, chapter 9, verse 15, Therefore he, Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Um, I guess I could see how somebody would try to make the argument that all of that is just potential and just enabling possibilities, but I see that as a much stronger intention that he died um, so that the ones that he calls get the inheritance, not so that if they choose or maybe they will, but just absolutely he died and it has this outcome for those for whom he intends it. 928, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, not all but many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. If I'm writing something, it just seems logical to me that if I write this, I intend the many in the first part of the verse to be the same group as those who are eagerly waiting for him. Uh, it doesn't say all, and I don't see any reason to shrink the group from the first half of the verse when it's talking about those for whom he died, and then in the second part of the verse when it talks about those who will be saved because they are eagerly waiting for him. That, that just seems to be a very strong parallel. Yeah, I agree. And I also had, maybe I should have put this, these verses up during my uh, philosophical discussion. But if you just go over to 10, um, it talks about Christ dying once for all and then sitting down. It's a one-time payment. It's not a meeting out of payment over time. Right. Um, so the atonement was a one-step deal. Either you were atoned or, or you weren't atoned for well, yeah, time. and verse 14 makes that explicit. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And here, I think, is an important kind of a, a revelation of what you're talking about, of us being temporal and experiencing things in time, and God looking at this from an atemporal standpoint. It happened once for all. It's applied to us. And yet we're still those who are being sanctified. We're, we're in the midst of a progress that includes our atonement and ultimately our glorification. God has all of that in a snapshot, so to speak, and we don't. Right. So our experience from our perspective is different than God's. Right. And that's what we're arguing about is yeah. what is God's action, His right. atonement, not our experience. Yeah. And, and this would be... You know, basically once for all, a single offering, he has perfected. That's done. It, it's a perfect tense, past action with ongoing effect. That, right. I mean, I don't know how it could be clearer than that, that it was done for us all at once. I agree. Have you read Death of Death by John Owens? Parts of it. I have it in the original, <laughs> um, which might as well not be English. I don't know if you've read the modern version. Or I've not read either one of them, okay. so I've got a note here to talk about that. Yeah, but I'm going. I'm working off of faith in the people who I okay. studied, who claim that John Owens makes an argument about double jeopardy in Death of Death. Um, there are a couple people who addressed it from both sides um, of the of the view, but basically his argument is 
if the extent of the atonement is unlimited, and he may not have he may not have used that word, but in our words we're going to use that today. Um, then there's a certain double jeopardy that's there. Mm -hmm. Another kind of logical argument: if someone's sins are paid for, then how could they end up in hell? Right. Um, how could you have the extent of the atonement be unlimited, but the application be limited? Either those sins were paid for or not. And we will get to some objections, and Tim Barnett has an objection to this, so we'll, we'll talk through that when we get there. But I think it's a sound argument. Why would the Father pour on his wrath to the Son for sins that will not actually ever be forgiven? It doesn't make sense to me that... Um, he would mete out his wrath against the son, and yet those those folks are not going to be redeemed. They're going to they're going to endure God's wrath a second time in hell. Yeah, I think this um, frequently the Arminians that I've heard arguing against Calvinism um, would set up what I would consider to be a little bit of a straw man, talking about how God's love is kind of bigger than the Calvinist says it is, or something along those lines. You know. How can you say God loves those that aren't elect? And how can God, loving God do this and that and the other? And I think this is a real problem for their position because how can a loving God pour out his wrath on his son and on a sinner for the same sin? If it's an unlimited atonement, then Christ bore the wrath for every sin of every person for all time. And yet we know... And I guess we're also presuming here a doctrine of hell that actually has people in it. Right, right? yes. So not we, a vacuous hell. Right. Or not a no hell or an annihilationism right. or something right. like that. So, But we know that there are people that are going to endure God's wrath for all eternity for their own sins. What a wrathful God the Arminians have. Right. I mean, I don't want to straw man or, or be unfair, but they would say that we don't have a loving God. And I would look at them and say, but you have God pouring out his wrath twice for the same stuff. Right. How is that fair or loving? How is that not monstrous? I mean, I've heard people say that if God's not omnibenevolent, then he's a monstrous dictator. Well, actually, it seems like a guy that pours out his wrath on two people for the same offense. I mean, that, that seems pretty heinous to me. So I... I I know there are objections to this. I do think that it's a sound argument as well. Yeah. If, if, if sin is actually, and I think this is why a lot of Arminians uh, go to, it's not actual atonement, it's potential atonement that then has to be applied and they kind of go to what I consider to be somewhat gymnastics. Um, but what does it mean, especially if we have a proper view of God in eternity who is omniscient, all-powerful, sovereign, all good. All those things that we know about God, what does it mean for there to be a potential atonement with, with that type of being? I, I don't know because yeah. I don't agree with that <laughs> argument, but I think that ends up pointing you logically back towards kind of the bucket analogy where it's like, okay, well, what we're saying is Christ's atonement was this valuable, and so people have to come to the bucket to get that to cover them or so, I mean it I, I quite honestly I just think it kind of makes mincemeat I used that last time but a little bit of mincemeat of what the atonement actually means I mean yeah. atonement means that it's dealt with it's expiated it's propitiated it's done it's not a potential action right so yeah I agree but we'll deal with some objections yeah to that. so any other positive arguments that you would want to put forward before we go to some of the objection versus and objection arguments? Um, well, uh, Matthew 121 is one that comes to my mind where it is the announcement of the birth of Christ and and you're reading just for our listeners and viewers, you're reading from what version of the Bible? Um, the extra saved version. <laughs> this is the ESV, uh, the best modern translation. Oh, I thought you had your CSB. I thought that was your CSB there. No, this is mine. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so, and by the way, we're just messing around with that. He's an NAS guy, I'm an ESV guy, but yeah. not onlyist. No. Yeah. No. Um, okay, so an angel of the Lord is appearing to Joseph in a dream, and he says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not... He will provide a means whereby they might possibly be... I mean, there's no conditionality here. It is his people will be saved by him. Mm -hmm. There's just... I mean, it's just a straightforward statement. I think it's it's pretty good and straightforward. And then a couple others that I would go to. um, John 10. Am I taking one of yours? No, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. I was turning there too, but go ahead and, and... We'll keep going. All right. Verses, um, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know you want to talk about the, um, what is it, double negation fallacy? Yeah. So typically what I heard in, in researching uh, this topic, because I've tried to listen to both sides. Right. Um, I want to be well-rounded. I didn't want to misrepresent what, they, what the other side would say. Um, but they kept mentioning this um, negative inference fallacy. And, there, and one, I think it was David Allen, kind of made a big deal of it. He's like, this is an actual fallacy. This is a known fallacy. It's a negative inference fallacy. And I mean, I can get behind it. Uh, Tim Barnett, I, I think Tim must have read David Allen's book because okay. they, they made a lot of similar uh, arguments as they went through, had a lot of the same language. Um, but Tim says something like, um, if I say I love my family, it doesn't logically follow that I'm saying I don't love my non-family. Mm-hmm. And we would agree with him. Um, so their argument against these verses, like I will save my people, or the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep, or Christ died for the elect, is that, well, that's true, we are inferring from those verses that he didn't also die for his non-sheep or the goats, or he didn't also die for the non-elect. I, I have a problem with that at some level because I think these are, are probably more clear teaching where they're talking about what did Christ come to do, and it's specifically he came for his sheep. And he says, I have some other sheep. I think he's talking about Gentiles. Oh, but you're getting ahead of me. <laughs> Uh, but he's talking about his people that he is going to call to himself. That's who he died for. Um, and so then they might come back, well, how do you deal with these other verses? We'll, we'll deal with those verses. Because yeah. I think they're making a different fallacy, which actually does exist. So I was telling you off camera, so I'll tell you on camera, <laughs> that I wanted to look at, because I have a master's in philosophy, why, and I've seen a lot of fallacies. I haven't seen them all. I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm the fallacy guy. Yeah. You come to ask me about a fallacy, I can tell you what it is. But I had never heard this negative inference fallacy. So I was like, I'm going to Google this. So I Google it, and there's just like lines and lines of articles about this subject, right. limited atonement. I was like, oh, I want it from a philosophical perspective first. And so I just start adding, if you don't know this, you can subtract words so that you won't get results that contain certain words. So like I subtract Arminian, I subtract atonement, and I keep having to subtract words because I keep getting biblical articles. I'm like, okay, I'll add Matthew because the book of Matthew kept coming up, probably 121. Yeah. And once I subtracted all the biblical words, there were no articles left (laughs) that dealt with the negative inference fallacy save one which was on bodybuilder.com <laughs> where noted philosophical font of wisdom yes yeah. but the guy actually alludes to a biblical he said i deal with this all the time what you've just done is called the negative inference fallacy you can google it if you want to find out more so so it doesn't exist outside of this topic uh, not that i found if you if you find it in a fallacy book or something i'm i want to read that I didn't find it using Google, which I trust to be a fairly extensive search tool. Tell me of a better one, right? (laughs) Well, okay, so let's kind of pick this apart for just a minute. I eat tomatoes. I would agree that I'm not saying I don't eat not tomatoes. Mm 
right? I'm not saying I only eat tomatoes. But we understand that eating is not necessarily an exclusive type of activity. I love my family. Um, we understand that love is not necessarily a, an exclusive activity. I die for my sheep does seem to be... More on the exclusive side. More on the... <laughs> Uh, by saying for whom I do this, I am saying for whom I'm not doing it. Um, I mean, if you want to, we can go to John 17 where Jesus says, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for them whom you have given me. I mean, we could go there, but... What if you said, I get up and go to work every day for my family? I think that's giving a purpose statement of why you get up and go to work. And I think you could say... It wouldn't make sense for you to say, and I'm also g going to work for my non-family. Right. Um, the, the purpose of you going to work is so that you have the means to provide for your family and, and the things that your family do. Now, obviously, there are some things that your family do that may be outside of just your family, but the reason you got up and go, go to work is for your family. Right. To assume that doesn't necessarily mean that you have committed the negative inference fallacy. Well, but... I guess the, the other thing that bothers me is I think if you look at the whole context of John 10, even if you say the negative inference fallacy is a real one that exists outside of the context of this discussion, I, I think Jesus kind of whittles away the ability to use it in this case. He, you know, I lay down, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good, and I'm jumping to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Implicitly there, he's saying, there are those who aren't my own, and we don't have this knowing relationship. You don't think it would be good exegesis to say, but he also means there are people who aren't mine that I know, and they also know me. Yeah, no, I mean, what would be the, what would be the point them. of saying that? Right. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I laid down my life for the sheep. I mean, he, he's, he's kind of doubling down on, mm -hmm. I've got my sheep, I'm dying for them. Does he really need to then explicitly say, and I'm not dying for not them? I mean, that, yeah. and then he continues, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I mean, there's clearly here a group that are his sheep. Some of them in the immediate context, I would agree with you, this is the ones of this fold are the Jews, and the ones of not of this fold are the Gentiles, but they're all his sheep. And I must bring them also, so that they will, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. It, th this is a highly exclusivistic or exclusive passage, mm -hmm. right? He he is clearly putting boundaries out. My sheep, not my sheep. Inside this boundary is what I'm dying for. I'm not dying indiscriminately. Or else, why would he say, my sheep, not my sheep, my sheep, not right. my sheep, got to go, got to got to gather them, and, and in that context say, and I'm dying for my sheep. It just, right. again, it, it seems like you have to have your conclusion ahead of time and come to this passage believing in unlimited atonement in order to read it into the passage. And, it, yeah. and the fact that you have to make up a philosophical fallacy Okay, that may be too strong. <laughs> the fact that it appears that you have to make up a philosophical fallacy just to get around what is kind of the plain reading of the text, right. that, that's telling to me. Right. I mean, I think there are times you could have a negative inference fallacy. I, if, yeah, you, I agree. if you wouldn'tly interpreted, I love my family from some human to mean, oh, well, that means you only love your family. I, th I think you could, cl but I don't think that that, the example, what you're saying is, while that may be true, that you're committing a fallacy there, those statements are not parallel with the statements we find in, in, the, in the Word. I, yeah, I think this one is clearly drawing out that there is an exclusion principle going on here. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for listening to part two of our discussion on the doctrine of limited atonement. Tune in next week for part three. You've been listening to Mike and Mike Theology Plus, the podcast where we talk about all things related to Christian theology.